nothing of a great state being established, assuming it could be without destroying uh, the world in the first place. So the, the point thing about competition is there's a kind of long-standing Enlightenment view we associate with Smith, with Tom Paine, with Kant particularly, that um, business is kind of peaceful, you know, that, that, that it's, you know, it's feudalism that causes wars, and that capitalism is a very peaceful system, and that we're all just trading with each other and buying and selling things, everything's fine. The experience of the last 300 years would cast some doubt on that, but it's not just because of people, you know, the advanced West um, colonizing and attacking the third world, it's also to do with people in the advanced West fighting each other. This is the point, World War I, World War II, more modest forms more recently. And this is the, the core of the Marxist theory of imperialism, and it's not just about colonies, it's actually about interstate competition between the most advanced states themselves, uh, leading to the chaos and horrors of, of the first half of the 20th century and since then. So, um, well, let's think about that and how that competition, which is not just about price or markets, but can be expressed ultimately in, in, in violence and war between different states, how that's panned out recently. I was going to talk about World War I, but it'll take us far too long, so let's talk about Iraq and why the, the Iraq war happened. Because when it happened, quite a lot of people said, this is really irrational. I mean, this is really kind of mad thing the Americans have done. The chaos is going to result in it. The, the oil companies aren't asking for it. This assumes a kind of vulgar, you know, the oil companies want something and the government does it, which isn't the case. But, you know, they don't want it. Is it because of the Israeli lobby? Are they doing it because the Israelis want it? And all sorts of conspiracy theories or, or ideas of simply a mad, irrational act. Well, it wasn't. Um, it was premised on a number of uh, positions that the American state managers uh, had at the time. One was that Russia was, and they thought this was clearly apparently in 1995, was completely out of the game and was in a state of utter disintegration, which it was at that point, although it subsequently recovered uh, as a power under Putin, and therefore America could basically do what it wanted. This wasn't true in 1991, actually, but it was true by, by the mid to late 1990s. They were able to, to move with impunity because Russia couldn't stop them, their great rival military power. So, what have you got? In the Middle East, you've got all these, you've got Israel, which is the only truly reliable ally that America has, because it's a colonial settler regime. But there are other states that from time to time have supported um, America, and, and Saddam's Iraq was one of them. So, of course, the Americans supplied Saddam uh, with the names of you know, communists and so on, so the secret police could kill them. They turned a blind eye to the murder of the Kurds in 1982, and they then used Saddam as a kind of proxy to fight Iran. Uh, during the, the Iraq-Iran War of the 80s. Sawdly and bed with them all that time. Then he invades Kuwait, partly because he was owed Kuwait um, millions and millions of, of dollars, um, and partly to reclaim the, the territory. At that point, of course, he has to be taught a lesson. And this is the first reason for the Iraq War. That America has to let its, its so-called allies or satraps know um, that they have to be obedient. They have a certain amount of leeway within their own area, but if they do something that's actually against the interests of America itself, you have to be taught a lesson in blood and destruction and so on, but it's a lesson for everyone to see what's going to happen to you if you step out of line. But, and this is the second point, it's also a lesson for America's allies, you know, for Britain, for France, for Germany. So, oh, you think you're very clever, we're getting involved in these, inter these international affairs and, and all the rest of it. Only we have the power to do this. You do it. We have the military muscle, so we are the leaders. You know, and this is basically putting the allies into line about the necessity of following American leadership in the world. Um, third, it's about oil, yes, but it's not about oil in the sense that the Americans wanted Iraq's oil. The Amer Americans had plenty of oil from other countries, some in Latin America, uh, some in Eastern Europe, and some in Africa. Um, the, the, Iraq, Iraq was way down the list of where oil comes from in terms of America's needs. But it was about oil, to the extent that they wanted to control the supply of oil. In particular, they wanted to make sure the Chinese didn't get hold of it. So again, this is the competition, right, between, in this case, China and America, that dictates what happens in the Middle East. As, as a kind of effect of the kind of struggle between emergent power of China and, and America. There was probably one internal <laughs> domestic reason for this. Um, um, how much time have I got left? Sorry? How much time have I got left? Lots. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> three. Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, so, so we've drawn on for too long. But, uh, the fourth and final thing was a kind of internal um, political issue, I suppose, and that's the unity of the Republican Party. Um, because when you think about it, the Republican Party, as we were recently finding out, uh, the moment that the Trump um, presidency bid, is a kind of a, an easy alliance of libertarian neoliberal economic liberals, of fundamentalist religious um, gun wielding lunatics. And these are not necessarily the kind of bedfellows you'd, want to, you'd, you'd expect in the same party. What can unite them all? A good American imperialist intervention in the Middle East. It was something that, that, that everyone can see some benefit. No, seriously, I mean, it, it, there is a kind of a point with this. There's a, a driver internally 
I mean, that's what, what the EU referendum's about, you know, in, in a sense, is that we're trying to solve the internal problems of the Tory party. Obviously, less violently and so on. But, uh, but, but it's, 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 but these kind of internal politics kind of affects externally as well. So I think that's all. I mean, the Americans didn't have to do this. They could have decided to re-energize their, their manufacturing base. They could have decided to take control of finance capital. But to do that, they would have had to attack the actual people who benefited <coughs> significantly from the oil policy, and they weren't able to do that. So the external imperial impulse was, was the one that took hold. OK, just to, to conclude this section. Um, the situation is worrying, because what we're seeing is not simply um, actual wars being conducted by the West and by Russia uh, against smaller countries. We're also seeing proxy wars being waged on behalf of the great powers. It's particularly the case in Africa, where a lot of proxies for France, um, and particularly the, the old sand mineral um, uh, properties in central, in central Africa. Um, I'm opposed, obviously, to Putin's seizure of Crimea, but let's be clear that the EU is, in a sense, using Ukraine as a proxy for itself as well. Um, now, the worrying thing about this is that World War I was preceded by a number of proxy wars <coughs> up to 1914. Uh, the Boer War, certainly Germany uh, using the Boers as a proxy for themselves against the British, the, the, the Russian-Japanese War, uh, with the same sides uh, lining up. So, and, and then that ended in the actual open war, of 1914, when the proxies didn't uh, sort of succeed in, in, in achieving their objectives anymore. So that is quite concerning. I don't think that you know, France is going to go to war with Germany anytime soon, but I'm not convinced that there isn't potential class between China and America, or that there's the possibility of some kind of struggle between Russia and NATO. If, for example, Putin decides to grab some territory that's actually that NATO is committed to, to coming to the defensive. So these are, these are kind of worrying times. Now, in the state of that, you think, well, War is bad. <laughs> Stop it. And this is where, in a sense, the argument about nationalism comes in. And it's functioned, uh, you will again, under capitalism, <coughs> and, and, well, because it doesn't exist in any other system. In a way, I'll talk about the working class in a minute, but in a way, uh, nationalism is also essential for the ruling class uh, as an ideological binding. It's not just a kind of trick, it's not just something they, they do to us, you know, to ha ha ha, we'll, we'll, we'll fool them into thinking they belong to the nation, and that's more important than class. I mean, they do try to do that, but they also need it themselves, in a sense, because if they weren't, didn't have some sense that there was a kind of higher purpose to what they were doing, then a, a ruling class simply degenerates into a kind of gangster class. And we have seen societies like that, they don't tend to survive very long. So in a sense, it's important to understand nationalism isn't just a kind of false consciousness that's kind of imposed by the master population, it's something that the ruling class themselves actually believe in, to a certain extent. They have to believe in it. So all that bump with Britain, we're doing this for Britain, blah, blah, blah. And that's probably all the truth in their minds about this, they've self-identified to that extent. But mostly, um, nationalism is important for the majority of the population, which is the working class, still. Um, just a point about this, actually. My calculations would be <coughs> that about 75% of people in Britain are actually proletarians, in the classic sense of having to sell their ability to work and having no control over what they do. The remaining 24.5% are, are not. The 24.5% um, are different sections of the middle class, and middle classes, and a very small number, or much less than 1%, by the way, constitutes the actual ruling class. This is completely obscure. You wouldn't know this. I mean, if you, if you, if you read kind of general popular discussions about the death of the working class and so on, how all middle class now, etc. Um, but it's important to bear that in mind. Um, if that wasn't so, then actually nationalism wouldn't be required, I think, in a way. Now, nationalism unifies the ruling class and disunites the working class. And that's not just on the obvious sense of migrants are coming here to steal our jobs, which we're obviously hearing quite a lot of it now, it means defining some people as other, some people as being not part of the nation, or indeed that also works at the European level, as we can see from the people desperately trying to figure out the Europe and being turned down at the moment. But in this, it's not simply a ruling class um, trick, it's also something which comes from the sense of the working class itself, and the labour movement itself, which tends to operate in a kind of national basis. You know, so I've heard, as Jamie was telling me, one of the, somebody from the Fireman's Union this morning was on the radio, Talking about, it online. Well, online, okay. <coughs> about migrants coming here and stealing our jobs. You know, and that's like our jobs. <laughs> you know, uh, like they belong to us because we're British and, and so on and so forth. So that, that kind of thing seeps in. I mean, that's a pretty horrendous example of it, but that, that kind of thing is part of what supports the idea of, 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 of different nations and nationalism. Now, neoliberalism has intensified all of the kind of things that, that, that capitalism has historically done. It's treated <coughs> human relationships and turned them into market transactions. It's, taking human capacities to do things and turn them into factors of production. 
Uh, and it made the self-identification of people not as workers or as citizens, but as consumers, uh, the, the, the primary way of people were thinking about themselves. Um, the problem with that is, from a capitalist point of view, is the potential for kind of breakdown, for a kind of social collapse and disintegration under that level, those levels of alienation is very real, um, but can actually bind people together in some sense that, so that that kind of breakdown doesn't actually take place. This is where nationalism has generally played a role. Um, people might be familiar with uh, du Bois, the great uh, black American Marxist, his theory of psychic compensation. He said that people, whites, poor whites in the south of America after the Civil War, um, generally speaking, were only marginally, marginally better off than the blacks who were sharecroppers and so on. But they were white. And they derived a kind of psychic compensation, he says, from the fact that their whiteness, that they were respected by police officers and, people, and, and, and black people weren't. It gave them something that wasn't material, but actually gave them something that tied them to the system because of the way in which it made them feel superior. So nationalism does something like this generally, I think. The people who accept that nationalism exists is the idea that that uh, it, 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 we are British and have to offer that matter Scottish, and that's something, something that's superior to other people. So all nations have to do this. Um, and kind of Soviet liberal, hey, we're all one human family kind of thing, don't really tend to cut it in quite the same kind of way as this. The point you're making is that nationalism isn't a good nationalism or bad nationalism. All nationalisms do this. Uh, and, and it's implicit that the why, because it's tied in with the nature of, of capitalism and the system. So psychic compensation is one thing. The second thing is you could say that, that nationalism recreates at the political level what has been lost at the social level. The kind of binding, the social binding has been the collapse, is kind of recreated in terms of pure politics. Uh, and you, can, you can see that again in much of the discourse around about um, the, the referendum. And finally, of course, and most obviously, it mobilizes people in the competition against other states, or if not states, then other people, the people are desperately trying to get here to flee from Syria and Libya and so on. And it can, it can cause problems. I think that we are seeing one of those problems now in this referendum. Um, it's, I mean, it's not some great conspiracy. This is a disaster for the Tories uh, that they've ended up in. I mean, you know, the idea that the leading party of British capitalism might actually achieve a policy which is opposed by almost all British capitalists. It takes some going to do that. You know, for a, you know, the, the quality of ruling class leadership has certainly declined a few years. And the leaders also died up in this kind of state, but Boris Johnson is a serious contender for the leadership of the British political capital stand. You know, I, I think we need to quite seriously how bad this is for them. You know, it's not some sort of a tremendous scheme they've had. But the point is, this started from the kind of, it was always Tory hostility to Europe, a kind of little empire, little England kind of thing. But, there was a serious attempt to ramp up imperialist nationalism and direct it against uh, Europe and, and, and particularly against the possibility of migration from the, the late 80s and early 90s. Um, by people who were, some of them quite sincere, some of them completely bonkers, but nevertheless there was a position which was used partly in, in the electoral struggle with the Labour Party and partly to win internal battles in the Tory Party itself. That has got completely out of control. This is why Cameron had to call this, this referendum, because this is a real I mean, however mad it appears to us, this is a real political tendency within the Tory party, which has very little connection to any strategic orientation of British capitalism. I mean, it's not as if there's, I mean, there's some small petty bourgeois, small capitalists, maybe one or two of the financial houses in the city that don't depend so much on Europe, are aren't that bothered or are rolling on the right to Europe, but most of the, the rest of British capitalism wants to stay in. So, um, this is how it happens when a sense a certain kind of nationalism gets out of control. Uh, and you can't, they can't control it now. It's, it's leading them into this disaster, I think, for them, uh, which there's no way out of. But what would replace it? Um, Benedict Anderson, the great, one of the great theorists of nationalism, um, said, you know, who would die for the EU? <laughs> and, I mean, a lot of people are dying because of the EU, but not actually uh, in defense of it. It's not something you're going to go to the barricades to defend the EU, I hope. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it simply doesn't have that kind, of, you know, that kind of deep sense of identification that people have with the nation. It can't, I don't think. Um, so could you go further down? Could people identify not with the nation state, but with their company, you know, with the people they work for? Yeah, people are laughing already at the thought that, you know, it's sort of Starbucks, you know, do, 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 do you know a Starbucks song or something when they start with the You know, there are some Japanese companies that they actually do, you know, call aesthetics together. But I mean, this is very rare, and it's obviously completely phony and people don't believe it. Anyway, you can't identify with your work, your employer, because the, the naked relations uh, of, of antagonism are usually so clear that you, you know, it's impossible for this to happen except for for really strange people, I guess. <laughs> so that's impossible, I think, for nationalism to be abandoned uh, and liberal internationalist kind of uh, appeals, you know, to, 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 to European Enlightenment values, uh, which I've already mentioned, I don't think I don't have the power to replace that. 
the only possible alternative to nationalism is socialist internationalism, uh, and I believe that can only be built from below and not through the institutions of the EU, for the sake, as, 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 as some or more deluded to union leaders have been suggesting. Okay, to conclude, um, two points, one of each of the, these things, the competition and the consciousness. I think that the, the capitalist state, nation state in the West certainly, is undergoing something of a crisis in general terms, and that's been brought about by neoliberalism itself. In a sense, it's been too successful a strategy for capital. It's actually weakened the state in, in all sorts of ways, in economic ways, with the powers of intervention, for example, with the dismantling of exchange controls would be one thing. Um, there are, in a British case, specifically handing over the power to interest rates to an unelected committee of the Bank of England. I mean, interest rates are one of the powers that the Prime Minister used to have, not any longer. I mean, you could take it back, but it would require a fight to do that, and a kind of struggle which most um, contemporary politicians aren't prepared to make. So, in a sense, if you think back all the great social thinkers, you know, Smith, um, what is the worst form of government conceivable? A government by merchants. In other words, a government by capitalists. And he's supposed to be the great supporter of capitalism, right? And he was quite clear that he needed a state because these people weren't interested in the greater social good. They weren't even interested in their own class's greater good. They would do things in competition with each other for their own interests and therefore wouldn't matter what happened. Marx makes some, a similar point in Capital in his discussion of the factory laws. He says, you know, the British Parliament, they're not the most intelligent bunch of people we've ever met, I'm paraphrasing, but something like this. They're not the most intelligent bunch of people we've ever met, but they're more intelligent than the factory owners because they understood you have to, you have to shorten the working day, you've got to improve conditions to a certain extent, or else the system is, is going to collapse. Joseph Schumpeter, another right winger, um, in the 1940s, said something very nicely. He says, the bourgeoisie needs a master. Mm -hmm. It needs someone to actually organize stuff for it, and it has to be the state. And uh, that, that can look above the interests of the individual capitalists and, and, do, uh, and do something in the interest of the system. What is actually happening now, I think, is increasingly it's the, in, it's the interests and wishes of individual capitalists and those powerful ones. And in this country, that means financial capital are directly feeding into the kind of policies that are, that are happening in a way that the state isn't standing back and being able to take a judgment that becomes necessary for the system as a whole, let alone the people as a whole. So that, because of that crisis, is going to produce more nationalisms, more attempts to escape the burning building by erecting a new one, um, which is essentially what's happening in Scotland. Now, that, I support Scottish independence, but let's be clear, that is not an ultimate solution. But that's <coughs> what's happening. We're going to get these kind of emergence of new nationalisms or, or old nationalisms and new forms as a way of trying to, 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 to escape the crisis and the continuing set of problems. We have to have an attitude towards that, obviously. And here I think we have to make one final distinction, which I'll finish on, which is that I, there's a thing called national consciousness, the sort of awareness of belonging to a kind of national group, cultural or linguistic or historical kind of group, which the Scots have had very strongly um, for quite a long time, at least since the 18th century. And I think it did start then, actually, rather than earlier. But nationalism wasn't something that the Scots had, particularly, until, again, very, very recently, and really for most, most people it's the last 10 years or so. Um, the nationalism in Scotland has been incredibly weak historically, uh, even when it began to get elected people in the, the mid-60s and early 70s. It has been nationalism. Um, and the fact that it's happening, that people support independence now, doesn't necessarily a nationalist position either. It's possible, I know there are people in this room who also take this position, that we want independence for social reasons. We want it because we want to see it as part of a struggle for socialism, a, 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 a ability to fight for a better world, and not because we're nationalists. In that kind of sense. So I think we have to maintain those distinctions. It's very dangerous, I think, at the moment that the possibility of people being sucked into nationalism, thinking of themselves as primarily Scottish, that's a danger. But nevertheless, I think it's one that we can resist because of the way in which the campaign um, two years ago was fought. It means the left has some kind of basis for, for opposing that. So, um, with the happy thought of the disintegration of the world capital <laughs> system and the <laughs> endless struggles with the magic of that, I'll leave you with that for the moment and then hand over to Jamie Hall. <laughs> Thanks very much, Neil. Uh, I just wanted to introduce Jamie Allenson, who is probably known to many of you. He's a lecturer at Edinburgh University and a member of UCU, which is the University and College Lecturers Union. You probably know that but just in case you don't. And uh, he's also an editor of Salvage Quarterly. So welcome, uh, Jean. Thanks very much, Pat, and thanks, uh, Neil, as well. It's always a pleasure to denounce Neil, uh, <laughs> to be given a special amount of time to do it. So probably just for two and a half hours <laughs> this evening. Uh, this is a really great selection of essays that 
Because Neil writes a book roughly every fortnight, <laughs> you kind of lose track of his achievement in a way. And this measures it from the first articles that came out in the International Socialism Journal to the kind of post post referendum um, interventions in the New Left Review. So it's I think it tells you a lot about the actual enormous impact that an achievement that Neil has had on Marxist thought, um, interpreting classical Marxist thought without being dogmatically bound to a defensive interpretation of it, um, which, you know, given that he's from Aberdeen, is also quite remarkable. Um, it's dedicated, as, as Neil said, to a great comrade and friend, Al, who can't, unfortunately, can't be here tonight, but we'll hopefully see the, the video, and that's, that's well deserved. I also realised when I was reading this that it's exactly coterminous with the amount of time that I have known Neil. So the first essay, uh, I, I first met Neil, I don't think he remembers this because I probably had hair at the time, mm -hmm. but I first met Neil when he came to Dundee to do a, a talk on the ethnicity essay. So I had just joined the Socialist Workers Party a few months um, before, Neil came along, stayed in it for 14 years after that, I don't know if that was um, related. Um, but what struck me about that talk was, first of all, Neil didn't choose to affect any kind of East End of Glasgow kind of proletarian mock accent or um, pretend to kind of come from Hackney as some of our <laughs> speakers would, uh, just kept going in his very pleasant Doric bar. Um, but also did not, uh, did not rely upon any cliches to make his argument. So he went directly to what is actually being said about the topic and he presented a Marxist argument for it in a 